Hello, ladies and gentlemen. It's week two here at EGF, and the Rocket League action does not stop. My name is Dor, and I am joined by the always wonderful Hunted for tonight's beginning matches, the first of which is going to be a real schlobber knocker. Hunted, are you as excited as I am? Absolutely. I always look forward to Collegiate Rocket League and uh, EGF. I mean, week number two, two teams. We get to start the day with... Uh, who have uh, taken a victory in week one. So we're going to see which of them stays undefeated. Yeah, they were really, really strong ones. Colorado looked all around just like a solid team. Delaware, uh, to remind you guys, one of the, the teams alongside RIT in the running for number two, with UTA being at top last season, was going nuts. We normally characterize them as a very defensive team, but now they're looking like they've just got everything they could ever want hunted. I'm ready to watch this match just as much as you are. Let's get straight into the action. Colorado in the blue, Delaware in the red. A, li a little bit of a change from their normal color scheme, but I'm sure they'll do just fine. Well, we are underway, as you mentioned, as Deco Flover and Starvin for Colorado. That's going to roll in. Oh, no, an own goal to start the game. Not exactly what Colorado wants to see. I didn't even get to introduce Delaware. Growl, the human L, and Vixa. And his growl out of the corner. Makes it a one nothing game for Delaware. Yeah, watching this team last week, Grau and the Human L, both veterans here at EGF, we know them, we know how good they are. Solid players. Vixa is the one who's mixing things up, and I don't I don't think that this is a bad mix up at all, right? This uh side lost one player over the course of the offseason, but Vixa seems like a great replacement. What they've given them is basically just a lot more attacking prowess, a lot more attacking side. Balls like this are ones that we wouldn't see Delaware go for in the previous season, attacking deep into the opponent's half. But now they seem more confident than ever, playing especially out of those counterattacks. We'll see how that works out as they do have this one goal lead right now. Growl trying to make it two. Clover just able to play it away. Look for a back pass, will actually send Vixa into his own corner. Solid challenge there. As now Deco going to wait for this one. Growl back to the midfield. We continue to play one nothing here. Delaware in the lead. A minute gone, game number one. Good demo on the backside there. Going to open up a little bit of space here for the human L. Can't quite get that one past. Will bounce out. Top of the box, cleared on. And looking like team's going to reset. Colorado, just not a whole lot of offensive uh, opportunities yet. They've kind of been stifled at the midfield line for a, most, uh, for a majority of this game. Yeah, and getting it out of there is going to be the real trick. I get the, the feeling, the sense that once they break it, they won't have too many problems doing it again, but they've been put on the back foot for so long that they're getting comfortable there, which is always an unfortunate thing to see. You kind of have to shake it up, play a little bit more aggressive to build out of your own half, and they have managed to do that a little bit. Now they're stuffing Delaware at their own midfield. It's about capitalizing on this pressure, though, creating opportunities, which we haven't really seen from them. They're a bit timid to go deep into those corners and play for the ball possession. However, Delaware are not chip over the top ground to lay it down but it's just not a great angle for Vixa to try and lay this one in has to go for a tap over sets up his teammate but Flover is there first and he is able to clear it away so set starving up play this one in and out of the corner ground there to knock it down as we approach the half time one nothing still on the scoreboard here as Deco tries to send Flover on great shot score Colorado responding here just before the half we're tied at one this is exactly what we saw at Colorado last week. Really, really great coordination between players. The passing plays were pretty much all over the place and extremely consistent. It's something that we'll likely see from both of these teams as the series goes on. And I think that one's really just about shaking off that one goal lead, right? You get the own goal out of your system, that's it for the series. You know, you're not going to let it happen again. Oh, no. Oh, okay. I thought I was about to eat my words there for a second. Deco's going to get the save, though. Human L for one more. No, just about halfway through this game, though. The score's all tied up. I don't think it's going to get too much higher scoring. This next goal might be enough to end it. Yeah, with how this game is gone, certainly would not be surprised if we see the next goal uh, deciding this one. However, still plenty of time. 2.10 left to go as Colorado tries to break out. They, again, they really haven't had a whole lot of offensive possession. They were able to score on a quick transitional play. We'll see if they look for that a little bit more. As now Grau's going to take the giveaway. Deco has to make a good save. Fixa just trying to keep it in the corner for the moment. Humanella is there. Now Flover patiently out of his own zone by Vixa. Grau last back. This is going to come off the back wall. Deco looking for a pass. Starvin's there for the shot. 
double commit by the Delaware defense. Not going to hurt him as Colorado just couldn't get that shot on net. It'll stay 1-1. Yeah, so far I've been pretty impressed by Colorado, right? They're kind of the new kid on the block. Delaware has already proven their medal here at EGF. So being able to put up with the amount of pressure that we're seeing them put out, especially this season with Vixa on the roster, is impressive, right? They haven't been locked into their own half. This one seems pretty much dead even. Flick over the top, though, leads to a, Ooh, maybe a shot here from the man himself. It's going to be a 2-1 lead up for Delaware. And I like this play from Growl. Recognizes the space he has, uses it perfectly, gets the bump on the backside as well. That is what opens up the space for Vixa to slam that one home near post. To put Delaware up by a goal with a minute 10. All that remains here in game number one. We said this next goal might be the equalizer. I'm sorry, the, uh, the winning goal. But it does look like there will be an equalizer immediately afterward. Flover collecting their second of the game and it's 2-2 oh boy this one just gets better and better whether it's individual mechanics whether it's team play i feel like the pressure is very calculated from both sides right it's never been too much there was a small counterattack from colorado but even that was a solid team play that ended up just being a, a pass into the midfield that got tapped down by a flover so it, there's no weaknesses right now for these teams at least at obvious ones for them to be exploiting. I feel like they both ne just need to keep playing their game and uh, figure out who's gonna come out more so on top. Right now though, it's UD in possession and the Colorado side, they're running out of boost here. It leaves the room open for Vixa to try and hit a shot, but just barely misses it on the way up. And the boost game certainly gonna start to matter here. There's only 35 seconds left to go, but it's gonna be a tense 35 here for Colorado. Good play there. Vixa up for it, beats Starvin to it. Double touch opportunity saved away. Deco at the near post grabs that boost as well looking to get this one clear it will bounce to the top of the box laid away by Deco Grau gonna take that away nobody home for Colorado and they give up a soft one with 12 to go I mean I, I honestly as much as you you know you could say right there's nobody in goal somebody should have been rotating there they had no boost they couldn't get there in time and, and that's just the unfortunate part great job on Grau's part though to actually recognize the opening, come in, find the intercept, sneak the shot in between two players. Likely seal out a first game, but Flover might have something to say about it. Up, does he get over? No, Vixa just barely going to win that 50-50. At least keep it even to keep the ball in the midfield. Starving to lay the ball forward up to his teammate. Deco has one more opportunity, but that's going to be the ball laid into the ground in a 1-0 lead for the Delaware side. And it's a, a tough game, a very close game between both teams as uh you know colorado again didn't really look uh great on the offensive side they never really got the shooting opportunities you can tell that by just the shot totals they only had three shots in that game they were able to put two in but if they want to keep up with delaware they're gonna have to start winning these midfield battles it's a tough game to play obviously we saw the boost starve come out at the end of that game and that stems from the midfield play it's it's not easy but you've got to start to deny the midfield access. I mean, Delaware had 12 shots in that game. You can't be giving up that many shots if you expect to win this series. Yeah, it's something that we've talked about before here, about how uh, how it actually affects playing on the defensive side. Whenever you're on the back foot constantly and you get comfortable playing defense, all of a sudden you stop thinking about the midfield. Yes, you get comfortable there. Yes, you're making save after save after save, but... When you only are doing defensive rotations, you're never making the move to actually get out of your half. And that's the real change that we have to see from Colorado right now. Well, we are just about ready for game number two. And I, I agree. I I think uh, Colorado, obviously the team that's going to have to change something up as uh, we will get this second game underway here soon. Might have a bit of a server issue. We're, we're getting that cleared up. Uh, but coming into this, we talked about both teams um looking for their second win to stay undefeated and i think the big story delaware taking out rit in four games rit a pretty solid team uh all around i think and with delaware coming off of that win maybe a little bit of momentum into this one yeah and you, you have to think right this is time for colorado to think this is time for them to reset but if they can't do it after one game can they do it after two right what, what's the point of no return for them in this series yeah, I, I'm not. I'm not entirely sure. As we uh, we are looking for uh, again a little bit of a server issue here. We we are getting that sorted, and 
Um, you know, I think no return. Uh, it's a it's an interesting question in a game like Rocket League uh, because in a best of five, right, you don't want to go down 0-2 in those types of games. It's very, very difficult to, number one, win that third game and then maintain that momentum into two more straight wins. And uh, I, I always think Rocket League is a great game for resetting. You've only got to play those five minutes no matter what the score was. It's always going to be nil-nil into the next game but if Delaware continues to play this way and they don't have any resistance again at that midfield line then uh it's going to be tough to try to reverse sweep this team um if they can't change something up heading into game two yeah I, I think the biggest thing that Colorado really has gunning for them is just their shot consistency right there was only three or four shots in the entire game for them that were out there every single one of them was a pretty serious threat uh, mm -hmm. And making two of those is no small feat. So when they get into the attacking half, they're feeling pretty good. Again, though, like you said, they're getting stuck in the midfield. I think for them, playing the ball up has been a lot more profitable, right? They they seem to have the passing game in the air down a lot better. Delaware does play some solid defense. Obviously, they, they're still stuffing them up in the midfield when that happens. But playing it low and on the ground really hasn't been the ticket for them. Sure, certainly, and and the transition play definitely something that Colorado needs to continue. They had a, a very beautiful goal to start their scoring in the series. I would love to see a bit more of that. But it does look like server issues have been solved. We are heading into game two now. Obviously, teams going to stay in the colors that they were. Colorado still in that blue as Grau looks to open the scoring with a double touch. Couldn't quite get the angle. Mixa into the back wall and already a demo on the colorado half that's another point that uh, i was going to make too maybe we start to see a little bit more physical play from the blue side here i think it definitely opened things up for them they just have to find the creativity to get there right everyone starts off the series for the most part just playing some normal rocket league it's what adjustment do you have to make to throw the opposing team off guard and right now colorado hasn't quite found that change yet delaware with continued pressure though just keeping somebody constantly right in the 18 meter room and creating so much just tension within the Colorado side. That, though, that'll break it immediately. The demolition, like you were talking about, completely shuts down the rotations of a team like Delaware, opens up the door, and you can see they, they break out of their half. They get a reasonable touch towards the net. They just get a couple more of those. They can start building into maybe even a first goal here. Oh, boy, Starvin's in. Flover can't quite get the finish, but the ball's definitely in dangerous territory here for the orange side. And again, that's the quick transitional play from Colorado and nearly worked out. For the first of the game, they couldn't quite get it on net. As now Vixa will break this one out. Good dunk there by Grau. It will come out of the corner. Human L. Nobody really waiting out in front. And this will be Flover on a free clear. Grau can't find a touch. This will be off the ceiling. Tico's there. Double no. It will bounce out. Quick shot saved. This one's going to pop over the head of Starvin. And it looks like Delaware going to get a little bit of respite here from the Colorado attack. As with 3.20 left to go, still no score, but Colorado much better on the offensive side so far. Yeah, Colorado's really one of these. This is a double, almost triple commit into the opposing half. They did it on the last attack, too. They're very adamant on finding this first goal, giving themselves some sort of lead so they can feel remotely comfortable in this matchup. And I'd be willing to bet we're going to see it again. Just some heavy aggression from this team. One's going to ring off the crossbar. Oh, goes for the demolition. Starvin, fortunately, not able to jump over and hit the ball, but still... A lot of pressure on the backs of Delaware, taking away the boost. Oh. Barely going to be saved by the human L. But still, the ball in Colorado hands is exactly what they needed, especially when one's laid up. Flover going to lay it off the backboard, but nobody is there to finish. Deco just going to be holding all of his cards close to his chest. And it will pass us by here. The halftime, nil, nil, still on the board. Starvin nearly catches Grau a bit too far forward there. Not ready for that. Whiff from his teammate was Growl. Almost got punished for it. Great pass out towards the mid. It's blocked away again. And the Delaware defense continues to hold as now Deco is trying to play this out of his own corner. Can't get by Vixa. He's going to pop up at the midfield line. Flover over to Deco. Back to Starvin. Can't quite connect on that pass. Growl. A little bit of a break. Nobody in the goal, but they are back now. Flover with a good touch. Going to keep that one out of the hands of the attacker. And it will stay. Nothing, nothing. We saw a one-goal game in the last one. There's the human L. 
to put Delaware on the board first. Very quick to this ball. It's one nothing. Boy, he snuck that one in. Look at this angle. Oh, my Lord. Right off the post, too. That's a tough one to save for Colorado. And, you know, I feel like I'm watching the previous game just with reverse colors. It's been all Colorado on the attacking side, but Delaware off of just one shot find the back of the net. And the consistency is there for both these teams. This entire game just lies on a knife's edge. It could change at any point in time. But at this point in time, it's Delaware in the lead. Colorado still playing catch up as another danger shot comes in at their net. It's human El Dico. Oh, I did not think he was going to get to that one. But Will just his bumper left. Put the ball into the back corner. Fake out Growl for a cross. But it will get back into the orange side's hands, taking a lot of time off the clock. Yeah, the clock is continuing to tick. Only 70 seconds left. Dico almost caught the defense napping there. Good touch from Human Elk, does keep it away. Final minute. Starvin, back to the midfield. Good touch there from Vixa. It's gonna force Flover into a tough spot. Vixa wins the challenge. Nico gets there in time, big double commit could be dangerous. Vixa is gonna be last back. Quickly on to Flover, back to Deco, but it's just a bit too far. And now they've got to try to set up the attack yet again. It's been good so far for Colorado. Just haven't turned anything into a goal. Here's a chance. Deco on net just a bit wide. Great bump shot. Score here for Colorado, and it's 1-1. Exactly what they needed. And it, it was a surprisingly simpler play than a lot of their other ones. But Delaware went up for two of those balls in the air and just lost a lot of boost and a lot of time on their way in. And I, I think that's it for Colorado, right? You just keep that consistent pressure of like earlier on in the game. And well, I think they did slow down after getting scored on. I think now they've kind of recognized it. Okay, you know, we, we do actually have to be playing this consistently, right? We can't just pull on the e-brake and put the bus in park and pray for the best. Delaware aren't going to give you those kind of opportunities like a lot, of the, a lot of the other teams are. You have to make them for yourself. And they have managed to do so. Less so, though, in the latter half of the game. Fortunately for them, though, capitalizing on the one that they did manage to get. It's Flover for a third opportunity over the top. It's back into the corner. I think we're going to see an overtime here, Hunt, and unless Deco has something to say about it. Well, ball's kept up in the air. Again, Humanel maybe trying to create an opportunity. Got to be careful, though. He doesn't, doesn't want to get caught at the midfield. Yeah, Vixa just going to play that right into the turf. We do have OT game two, and I do have to say I appreciate Colorado not panicking after going down a goal, even with how difficult it was to find that equalizer. It's nice to see them trying to settle into this game. They've played very well. We just need to try to equalize the series now as Flover will play this off his own back wall. Bit of a giveaway. Vixa nearly took it away. Does find its way back to the midfield line. Flover now down in front. Great play. Oh, no, it's right off of Deco. That could have been the game ender there for Colorado. A little bit of misfortune, and we play on. Yeah, I know we always say a team's true colors come out whenever it turns into that golden goal, and right now, Delaware just continues to attack in Colorado are going back to what they were doing in game one playing just a little bit more conservative and right now it kind of feels like the right call because there have been a few moments where I've seen Delaware and the ball rolling towards their net with nobody in front of it so there are those opportunities there for them to oh, capitalize oh. oh human L oh you didn't have to do them like that what a nice little touch out of the air here spins it around gives them the fluke the dupe and it works perfectly it's just just a little bit of impatience there by the defender. Starvin, unfortunately, kind of look a little silly on that challenge. And it is Delaware to take a 2-0 lead now. And this is what I was talking about before we came into this game. This is exactly where you don't want to be if you're Colorado. Uh, I Again, it's not impossible to win three in a row. Certainly, we've seen it in all levels of Rocket League. But against Delaware. Delaware, who really were on the back foot for a majority of that game, but played the defense to win it. It's going to be very, very difficult for Colorado to try to win three in a row. And that's the crazy part about Delaware, right? It may not seem like that much to say that, oh, you know, they, they pulled it off defensively and they, they pulled it off on the attack side, but Delaware used to just be the defense team. They weren't <laughs> anything else. They just sat there and won the battle of attrition every single game, except for against maybe RIT half the time and UTA the other half of the time. But now, with Vixa especially, 
they seem so much more revitalized on the attacking half of the field that I honestly think that this is a real contender for first. I mean, they they have looked very good. Uh, it's it's very early in the season, right? It's hard to judge teams based off of one or two performances as Deco. Let's open the scoring here for Colorado. But I agree with what we've seen so far. They definitely show the chops of a, a matured team. And uh, that's what you want to see over, you know, the course of, of multiple seasons. You want to see teams grow. And I think uh, Delaware so far, of course, we are again in week two so far have shown uh, a good bit of that. And we'll see if that continues throughout the season. All right. Now, Colorado, they, they've still got a chance to shut them up here, right? The, la sure. the last thing you want is completely getting shot out of this series. And I think there's absolutely a world where Colorado can come in, take at least a game off here. I think that is perfectly realistic. Reverse sweep, like you said, against a team like Delaware who's so comfortable playing from the defensive side is going to be especially tricky. But, again, it's possible. These matches have been so close. Everything within one goal within the last 30 seconds or so. It, it really is anybody's match. There's a, a lot of opportunities here for Colorado. And who knows? Once they get a little bit of momentum behind them, who knows what they can do and what happens to Delaware whenever their mental gets a little bit messed up. Well, we are just a minute and a half into game three. Grau to play that one away from Deco Flover's going to turn on it. Good pass over to Starvin. Great pass back. Give and go. Couldn't quite get by the first defender, though this is a great play. Flover just couldn't get a touch on it. That was the best opportunity of the game so far. Now back the other way. Vixa back wall will be taken away. This one's going to fall right down to Humanel. Bouncer on net. Not quite hard enough. Flover will cut across to make the play as well. And we continue to go back and forth. Teams trading opportunities. And there's been shots left and right. This is arguably one of the more action-packed games that we've seen so far. Both of these teams are looking to play very counter-attack heavy. We've seen double to triple commits into the attacking half almost every time from both sides, resulting in shots like that. They're just ringing off the post left and right. Vixa in delay, one over top. Oh, it's a great shot attempt from Growl. Fortunately, not enough to angle it in towards the net. Delaware already has three members back on the defense, so this push is going to be tough for Colorado. They've committed uh. all three, though, and they're going to be punished for it. Vixa... Lays one in coast to coast. This guy is just chilling on the other side of the field. This is it's just basically training mode. I mean, I've seen that exact same setup off the wall. Yeah, I mean, it's a relatively easy shot there for Vixa, but it didn't have to be that way if you were Colorado. That was a very risky challenge from Deco. You've got two players pushed into the zone. You're the third man back. You know if that ball gets past you, it's pretty much a free goal. You're, you're sitting at nil-nil. There's no reason to go for a challenge like that, put your team kind of under the gun. I can I can understand wanting to keep pressure, but honestly, you do a bit better of a job as this one almost oh, no. it will go in. Another own goal here for Colorado. Grau's going to get the credit for it. And yeah, it's just little decisions like this one going to start to break down this team. Yeah, I'll give Grau some credit there, right? Angling it in towards the net. It would have gone in had it not been touched, but they're definitely... You, you feel like there had to be some sort of world there where he gets around the ball a little bit easier. So now Colorado facing the biggest deficit that they have yet has to overcome it in Game 3. They're already feeling like they're behind. It looks like they're already playing like they're behind, right? They're playing aggressive. It feels not desperate necessarily the bad sense, right? When you're down two goals, you have to play more aggressively, but it does make you appear desperate. It's very punishable for Delaware, and they're going to be looking for more of those coast-to-coast -coast shots, right? To intercept the ball in midfield while Colorado is moving out of their box, that's going to be a perfect opportunity for them to extend this lead even further. As you can see right there, just dangerous positions that Colorado have to take because they have to make up these goals. Yeah, time's certainly winding down. Need to find some aggressive plays. Now you're down two, 90 seconds left. Let's flow over back wall. Starvin's there, but Human L easily to it. Still... Deco tries to keep it moving. Grau uh, can't quite get that one by Vixa. Going to pop it up. That's over the head of Starvin. Human L tries to end the game right there. Deco just going to get a piece of it. Will stay in the Colorado zone for the moment as now Grau with an opportunity. Looks for Vixa. There's a touch. It should be Deco into the corner and time continues to tick on. 55 seconds. Delaware just trying to hang on to this two-goal lead. 
Yeah, right now the big thing I'm seeing from Delaware has been their backboard defense. I mean, just like that. They're not letting anything go for free. They're not letting anything rebound back towards the center of the field. It's making these attacks a lot harder for Colorado, right? They're not able to play the boost game. They're not able to starve them out. It's just been Delaware playing their rotations, stuffing up Colorado's, and keeping that ball in no man's land. They don't have to create opportunities. They don't have to play aggressive. They can just go back to old school Delaware, pull the e-brake, park the bus, and see what happens. But Grau's going to go up for a few more style points, a redirect in, and a third to put the nail in the coffin. Yep, that will most certainly end the series here. A 3 nothing scoreline in the game, and most undoubtedly a 3 nothing scoreline in the series as well. Colorado... Again, not a uh, not a bad series. I think you walk away from this one probably a bit disappointed as Starvin's going to at least break the shutout uh, here in this one. And I mean, yeah, you want to win these games, right? You, you hate to lose just about anything when, when you're uh, competing in a league like this one. But I think there's a lot of good things to take away, a lot of things that they, they can build on. I really liked their transitional play. I think if they... Uh, if they can turn that into a bit more offense, like, you know, making sure that they keep things in at the midfield, being a little bit quicker um, when breaking into the zone, uh, they can turn into a very, very solid team. They stayed with Delaware for a majority of this series. And even in game two, uh, had pretty much full control of the pitch. They just couldn't turn it into a win. And those are good signs when you're playing against a strong Delaware team. Yeah, this is the eSports Classic, like right? 3-0, but it was close. <laughs> and, yeah, sure, sure. And I don't think it, any match suits to this uh, that term better than this one. From game one, I mean, it was decided effectively by the own goal at the beginning. And I honestly have to wonder what would have happened had that own goal not happened, right? Had Colorado had a sure. bit more momentum, imagine a world where that own goal doesn't happen. They win game one. They're feeling a lot better game two, and they don't have to make as many aggressive plays. And game three i don't want to say it checked out they checked out but after that second goal went in you could feel them kind of take it down a notch against delaware's aggression and it left a lot more openings out for them and delaware capitalized like the consistent team they are yeah i mean there's a there's a stat that doesn't really get tracked too much in the rocket league community that i like to look at and i, I like to think of it as unearned goals and it sounds a little harsh to the scoring team but like the first goal in game three doesn't have to be a goal. It's an unforced error on the Colorado side. It turns into a goal and that really hurts your mentality, right? I mean, you're already down two. you just conceded the first opening goal early on and it, it can be tough to battle back. I still think Colorado played um, like their hearts were in it the whole way through. They just couldn't overcome. And again, I think you learn from those mistakes and you can only grow as a team and look to turn your season, uh, not even turn it around. You start one and one. You can't be too, too upset about that. Yeah. I mean, Colorado, they look strong, not strong enough to beat Delaware. Unfortunately, and Delaware look even stronger than last season right now for me. They're going to be the team to beat. There's more rocket league action after the break. Those three Manhattan taking on Marist. We'll catch you guys in just a few.
Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Week 2 here at EGF continues with our second match of the night. The last one proved to be just as good as we thought it would as the University of Delaware took a, albeit close 3-0 over the University of Colorado. We've got another good one on the back end, though. It's Manhattan up against Maris. Both of these teams are in a bit of a peculiar spot, aren't they, Jeff? Yeah, well, Marist uh, trying to replicate a little bit of that Delaware success, try to stay undefeated on the season. Manhattan uh, coming off a, a tough loss uh, earlier on uh, this, or well, not not this week, but last week they <laughs> dropped to uh, Niagara University 3-0. So looking to turn things around here in week number two. Uh, a pretty tough opponent in Marist, I think, um, it's going to have to be a, a good game from them here in game one to try to put their best foot forward in the series. Yeah, and Maris is one of those quote-unquote like classic EGF teams, right? They've always been very middle of the pack, though, even last season, uh, having middling results, to say the least. And Niagara, I mean, we mentioned them having taken down Manhattan. Niagara kind of came on a rise at the end of the last season out of nowhere after having such a rough patch. But up on the scoreboard today, it's Maris and Manhattan, two teams from last season, Ooh. and Maris is already coming out swinging tones that you guys know him, you guys love him. He's still going nuts here. And starting the scoring for Mayor's Tones, Z-Ball, and Cypher in that orange. Five seconds in from the midfield line. Solid bump on the backside as well. I didn't quite catch who that was. I think it was Cypher uh, on the bump, but Manhattan in the blue. Jason rocking seven in DeRay. As Tones looking to open things up again. Oh, Cypher couldn't quite squeeze it through. Will be played on by Jason still bouncing out in front. And already just from the outset of this game, uh, you can kind of tell that Marist looking to come out quite strong. They just, just from the first 35 seconds, and maybe this is a bit of a prejudgment by me, but they definitely seem like the more mechanical of the two teams as Tones looking for Cypher just over top. Almost a rebound finds its way home. Tones still looking for a shot. He'll find it 2 nothing. I'm digging the pressure from this Maris squad. You can tell just how long they've been together. And there's one thing I want to point out with that. These three players, same exact ones from last season, right? The coordination between these guys is just ridiculous, right? They've been playing together for... God knows what, three, four semesters at least with this exact same roster. So it's no surprise to be seeing them put on this amount of pressure. And on, on the opposite side of the spectrum, Manhattan, I'm almost certain this is a completely new roster for them. And so far it hasn't worked. Cypher's looking to line up even a third here. But fortunately for the blue side, they will be avoiding at least that much of a catastrophe. I'm sure Cypher will want that one back. Not sure how he hit the crossbar from where he was. But it does, unfortunately, ring off the bar. Stays 2 nothing, And I, I just realized, just to make this a little bit extra confusing, this is a, a battle of the MC teams. You think if we asked oh, them to, to, <laughs> to, like, rap battle to decide game two, you think they'd do it? Well, MC Marist and MC Manhattan? I, I feel like those sound like actual. <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah. I'd well, be I mean, here it's for it. like Marist College. I think it's Manhattan College, too. It's MC. Yeah, I mean, I if, we, if we go to Game Minecraft 5, teams if you want. <laughs> Game five's just a rap battle. That's it. Yeah. That's Tiebreaker it. rap battle. That sounds awesome. Somebody, uh, apparently, Tones does love to rap, according to chat. So that's already in favor of Marist. But, you know, getting to Game 5, I think, is going to be quite a task here for Manhattan. They have been uh, a bit outplayed in the first couple of minutes here of Game 1. Tones kind of try to look for that hat trick. Cypher does push it just a bit wide on the rebound. But again, right now, um, 
it does look like Maris just a little bit more mechanical, going to keep possession of this ball for a majority of this game. Yeah, and, and there's one thing I'm, I'm starting to notice that's kind of a forsayer of doom right now, and it's just the fact that Maris have been three men on the ground in front of their goal, and there's room for them up on the backboard. They could be playing a few more interesting positions. Right? I mean, there's two people lined up right in the front of the goal. You're not going to be finding many saves, and it's not necessarily out of a lack of knowing where to play. I feel like this team's rotations would be solid if they weren't so caught off guard by Maris. It's more so that they, they just feel a little timid, right? The confidence is taken away after he goes four goals down before the half is over. Cypher's looking to make that five even. Maybe Z-Ball boost his stats up a little bit. This one is not looking great for the blue side. I, I wouldn't even say it's hesitation. Again, I think it it comes down to mechanical play. The, the Maris squad just faster to the ball um than manhattan and you know it it happens in um the collegiate scene sometimes where you get these kind of face-offs between uh squads of varying ability uh cypher gonna knock this one home and and i mean look i'll, I'll put it to you this way door i casted a game for a different organization to be fair uh collegiate game it was a three game series well it was the best of five it was over in three and the total goal differential was 43 to nothing. Oh, that hurt to hear. That's... It was the yeah. longest series of my life. I mean, as a pastor, <laughs> what do you talk about after like, you know, 40, 40 I, goals to one side? I'm pretty sure we just get like tic-tac-toe going in the, in the upper corner or something. <laughs> <laughs> That's I, what it felt like. Especially, see, the, the weirdest part about some of these higher scoring, longer 3-0 series games are just the amount of time that you spend in the replay cam, right? It lengthens yeah. the series substantially, <laughs> the yes. amount of time you'll spend watching the, the same goal happen twice over. And honestly, this one doesn't seem like the worst of the bunch, right? Still six goals. Yep. Maris have stabilized to it, or Manhattan rather, stabilized to a certain degree, but haven't yet managed to keep the ball out of their net. Maybe we get a Brazil scoreline. I'd be here for a 7-1. How about you? Yeah, sure. I mean... I think anything would, would help Manhattan right now. You look at the scoreboard. How many shots is that? Quick math. 14 shots for Marist. Nothing on the shot total there for Manhattan. And I mean, it, it comes out in the gameplay. Again, I think Manhattan or uh, Marist just a bit uh, outclassing Manhattan to start this game. Cypher was looking to put that one, uh, put that one home. It will be saved away. And, Time going to tick by will certainly be a game one victory for Marist. This is a bit dangerous down in front. So I'm just going to play it into the corner. And and honestly, it, it can be a struggle for, for uh, you know, for teams when you lose. You know, you're losing a game 8 nothing at this point with a minute 13 left to go. It's, it's hard to continue to play these types of games. But honestly... You, you can learn a lot from games like this if you go back watch the replays it's gonna be tough to watch but you can pick up on things that the enemy team does that'll make you a little bit better yeah as, as a caster who sees this a fair bit there's something i like to do during these kind of series and instead of looking at the goals right i, I want to look at i'll call them style points but for the, it's really only style points for the winning team Right. So <laughs> how many style points can the winning team get? And for the defensive team, how many times can they shut down a goal that we would have expected to go in 30 seconds earlier? Right. Right here. Not exactly the case. It's an open net from half field from nine goal up. And this might actually be the first uh, the first game for Maris that they'll see double digits in their favor in the past two seasons. I, I'm not certain what happened in their previous match uh, in week one, but. As far as Maris last season, I can tell you for a fact, they weren't hitting double digits against anybody. Well, I mean, just looking at the score lines from last week, I believe the first, yeah, the first two games were one nothing victories. And uh, uh, yeah, all three games. I don't know if that's right. That could just be somebody forgetting to fill in the scores. But all three games were apparently 1-0 for Maris. As now they have... Uh, now it's one Odin. Ten now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's still kind of one nothing if you add an extra zero in there. But, uh, I mean, you look at Manhattan scores as well. They did not fare very well against uh, Niagara, I think. I'm looking at this. Game number one was 13-1. to one. Kind of tells the story of that. And, oh, man, this is tough. I, 
I I hate to, you know, I just wonder what it's like um, for the team. You know, week in week out, it's going to be teams similar to Marist. I I don't I don't even put Marist as the top spot. You know, considering watching Delaware earlier on, and it, it's great. It's a great learning tool, and I love that. But if you're the coach of a team like this, what what do you say to your players? I mean, it's, it's all about fundamentals, right? You're still learning the basics of Team Rocket League. You're learning about rotations. You're learning about positioning. And you're building up the basis of your mechanics. I don't think VOD reviewing this for them, uh, especially on their side, is necessarily going to help them, right? I think whoever's coaching this team knows what they need to be focusing on right now, and I don't think that's necessarily going to be a surprise after this game. Again, though, it's about how much can they progress. Because we, we have seen teams improve massively. I mean... For one, guaranteed, Niagara, last season. I spoke about it earlier. Bottom of the barrel, barely able to pull anything off, and then postseason turned it around because they had been improving over the course of the season. And you could see it visually, and I expect to see it visually in Manhattan as well. Every single season, without fail, that bottom team, they learn, they start contesting. Maybe they don't win the season. Maybe they don't get their semifinals. But they're going to start beating some of those middle-of-the-pack teams that get complacent. And we know that these guys can work hard. We've seen Manhattan succeed, and I expect them to do it again at some point during the series, or the season, rather. Well, certainly uh, uh, certainly, much to learn. I, I agree with you. Uh, again, kind of the stats uh, speaking for themselves and you know, not putting up a shot on the board, not going to be too easy to try to come back from. We'll see how they fare in game number two. Um. But, I mean, all things told, Maris does look uh, like they're playing as a cohesive unit for the most part. Um, you know, they're following, up sh they're following up shots. Their rotation seems uh, quite good on the offensive side. And uh, that's, that bodes well. It, it's hard to, you know, to really break down uh, games like this sometimes. But uh, I do like what I've seen so far from Maris. As looks like first oh! goal right off the kickoff is going to be Manhattan. You know, he took the words right out of my mouth. I was just about to start start talking about baby steps and right, right, setting little goals, right? Get a few more shots on the net, get three by the end of the game. Put one mm. goal in the back of that as, like, the end goal for this series. But they already did it. And honestly, it wasn't even – it was a solid kickoff, and it was a bad kickoff for Marist. That's all there was to it. Don't, wait a minute. Wait a minute. They're, oh. they're not sharking us, oh. are they? It, there's, no, there's no funny business, right? This would be one of the biggest con jobs I think I've ever seen if that were the case. It will be tied up at one. Good play. Actually, Tone's got bumped into that ball. And, yeah, I mean, so the thing is, too, Rocket League is one of those games where it is very easy to get complacent after a big win. I've seen it time and again. You know, teams, even smaller wins, you know, like 3 nothing, 4 nothing. teams will get complacent and just figure okay well this is in the bag and they don't play up to their ability and and it, it kind of lets other teams back in i don't necessarily think that's going to happen in this series but it's always something to keep in the back of your mind look I, wait like this is what i was talking about get awarding style points right the score's still 1-1 still doesn't look great ball control wise for uh for manhattan mm -hmm. but they're, they're kind of building out of their half the rotations sure. are – there's a semblance of rotation there. There's more – or there's less than two people going at a majority of these balls. It seems like they're communicating a little bit here, pressuring up the sideline. Rocking 7 going to play one into the middle. and It's just immediate improvement after one game. Yeah. And I, I don't need a win from Manhattan right now. I just need a showing that they can learn, right? And Jason has one up the wall. He's created an opportunity. that Again, they didn't have a single one of those in game one. Yeah, uh, I mean, I agree. Uh, and that was one of the points I was trying to make in that last game as well, is that it, a lot of it's going to come down to mechanics in this series. If you're just faster to the ball, typically you're going to have your way with, uh, way with the game. I don't think that Manhattan necessarily has poor fundamentals or anything like that. They certainly seem to be able to uh, get that rotation underway on the defensive side. I, I just, again, I think it comes down to being able to get the touches you need when you need them. Um, and if they can improve that, then certainly can grow into a pretty stable team as that's a good little passing play. Cypher is going to put that in the back of the net. Maris will retake a lead. Yeah, it's a nice play from Z-Ball, a solid pass. And that's the stuff I want to see not only against a team like Manhattan. I want to see it all over the place, right? That's a, 
a set play that you can pull off multiple times, and I think that's the kind of play that's going to score on even higher caliber teams now. Going back to what you're saying about just being able to find the touches that you need, and yeah, their fundamentals look, look pretty good, right? There's something to build on there for sure. It's the mechanics that I think Manhattan may struggle with the most because those balls up in the air are just completely uncontested right now, and it takes a little bit of time to learn that, but if they put in the time, they'll get there. I've got full confidence sure. they'll be able to challenge those at least. Sure. No, absolutely. It's uh, it's just going to be a bit of a struggle, I think, until until they get to that point. But, you know, regardless, they are looking to put up as much of a fight as uh, certainly possible right now. Only down by two as we approach the half. Cypher will try to keep this one in. Jason, they would get it back to the midfield oh, line. Ball. You're not allowed to fake him when you beat him like 10-0 last game. Ooh. Oh, that's, you know, uh, you get style points, but, oh, you hate to see it, <laughs> right? He's, he's just, he just came here. He's just chilling. He just got 10 0 He's having a little bit of a better game, and then you pull the mind games on him. Like, come on. Right when he was feeling himself. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to not do that as a <laughs> as a player. I mean, you get so, it's so ingrained in your play style after a while, right? I mean, oh, that's a bit of a miss there right off the post but no i i agree i think uh might have been a little rude but you well, know it's, it's always it doesn't matter how good the other person is it's disrespectful <laughs> man. you you faked him out you played his head it it is no matter what but you know <laughs> yeah I'll, I'll give you props you went for it well to be honest i still am down to start uh, to have a rap battle for game three at least like yeah. the first half <laughs> I, you know, I'd put money on us being able to get Tones in the call. If we'd make him freestyle <laughs> during the game. That would definitely even up the score. Yeah. Right? That takes uh, away a mean, player. He's got to use his brain for that. Uh, I mean, if it's... Yeah, I, I I don't know. Let's I say we try it. I don't know if he's uh, necessarily down with it, but hey, it would be fun. I wonder if Manhattan's got anybody who's uh, who'd be interested. All right now, again, 4-1 game, minute 20 left to go. As Maris still controlling pace of play. Manhattan opened the scoring with a uh, with a kickoff goal since then. It has been pretty much in the blue half. Nine shots on goal for Maris, but certainly a closer game so far as Z-Ball just going to play that one down and in. Good shot there. 5-1 now. And Maris looking to take a 2 0 series lead. Yeah, it's it's a tough one right now, but you know, there's so many things that you can look at Manhattan. Just be like, you know, get, give him a pat on the back. You know, we're we're proud of your son at the very <laughs> least. I wanna see more from, from Maris. They've kind of let off the gas pedal. They're having a good time with it. And I don't think they're they're putting they're all into scoring these goals, but they're definitely creating a few decent opportunities. For themselves, a lot of them have been very backboard focused. So, I'm looking at this point for things that they're going to use against some of the more uh, potent teams within EGF. And I think if you're just sticking to the backboard plays, you might be struggling a little bit against somebody like Delaware. Yeah. Uh, well, again, I think that uh, we've seen some good things from Marist, and in in these types of series, it can be quite difficult to read your opponent uh i i kind of have that from experience especially uh with how this new ranked uh system has worked out in the game where they kind of cobbled together everybody from high gc down to like champ one champ two and it can be quite difficult when you're used to a certain pace of play to read your opponents who don't quite play that quickly or or make decisions on that same kind of level so uh, we might not be seeing exactly what Marist is uh, is capable of 100%, but I do like what I see. They do seem to be working together well. And there you go. There's your Brazil. We've got one with 13 to go. If, if they can maintain this, I'll just – I need everybody in chat to go find and DM Upmind and remind him exactly <laughs> what happens every single time that it gets mentioned. Uh, the 7-1 to is just it, – it feels at home. Here at EGF for whatever reason. <laughs> Honestly, I want to see him keep it that way. Let's put uh, zero more goals up on the board for Manhattan. Zero more for Maris. And I'm, I'm chilling Ooh. with the scoreline. There we go. A 7-1. 
as it is foretold in the EGF handbook. Uh, seven one, not. Uh... Oh man, I remember. You know, speaking about that, I remember watching that that game live. I'm sure. You know, I didn't have a I didn't have a dog in that fight. Certainly, I think I was cheering for Germany in that game. But who I couldn't imagine being on the other side of that. I'm. That's why I I do kind of feel bad bringing it up on broadcast at times. Um. Um, no, we're going to try to get him in here. I, I, you know what? Maybe after game three, we'll, we'll see about an interview. And I, I would be willing to put money <laughs> on us being able to convince him. That... <laughs> rap as well I as rap as play. well as penguins fly. Interesting. We'll see if we can get <laughs> So, <laughs> So, wait. We're, we're saying that somebody in chat lied to us? Go figure, man. <laughs> what? No, no, chat, <laughs> chat doesn't lie. Twitch chat? Oh, no. Come on, chat. All right. Let, let's see. Let's see if they can lock up a game three. It's a big if, huge if right now for uh, for Marist. <laughs> and you know what? They haven't had the easiest matchups. They haven't had the hardest matchups. It's been not. It, it's been a mediocre schedule for them so far, but everyone's going to play everyone. And I'm confident that when they go up against someone like a Colorado, like so, someone like an RIT, someone like a Delaware, I really want to see what this Marist team can do. They're not being pushed right now, but I can't just wait to see what they look like when they actually are. Yeah, I mean, like I said, I'm 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 going back and looking at this to make sure I didn't make a mistake. Uh, last week, Marist played Quinnipiac University, and they went they three would that that game or that series. But unless the the scores are recorded wrong here on my sheet, they each one of those games was a one nothing game. Which technically means that Maris didn't have the goal scored against them, but they only scored three in the series. Uh, that, that to me, seems like either something's wrong or that series was very intense. And uh, if if that is the case, then I am looking forward to Maris games uh, throughout the rest of the season. As oh, Jason on the line oh. makes a great save wow. to start they the game. All three Manhattan players worked together, piled up their cars to get up to that ball. <laughs> yeah, that, that's the thing about having people who, who may be less mechanically inclined or less experienced in that regard, that they'll find a creative way to get to that ball, however it may be. Hey, hey man. Gotta, uh, I, I, I like the stacking idea. You got to, uh, uh, three cars are, are better than one on the goal line, but... <laughs> I mean, it's it's not often that you want all three of your teammates uh, stacking up on the goal line. It typically leads to a goal. They were able to make the save, to be fair. But uh, I think that's one of the that's one of the things is that you can't clump together in a game as fast as Rocket League like that, and it leads to some problems. And again, something that I think they can learn um, just from this series in particular is ooh, tones. That was a Pretty bad miss there. He had a wide open goal, pushed it wide. Uh oh, he, oh! I thought he read it for a second there. I thought he <laughs> had him. All right, it's still in the hands of Manhattan right now. They're gonna have an attacking opportunity. And honestly, with the one that they got earlier, granted it was directly off of a kickoff. Make of it what you will. They still are the first team to have scored on Marist this whole season. So, props to them for that. At the very least, even if the other games were close and 1-0 wins, they're not exactly. The uh, the cleanest for the team who ends up losing them. It's going to be more shots in from Tones, though. And at this point, I'm starting to feel like uh, Marist are going for a few more of those style points individually. Well, they are looking for more passing plays. And, and that's nice. As Jason, oh, turn it in, please. Did he do it? Oh, it's going to roll away. Tones gets there just in time. Oh, that one hurts. Wide open goal. Manhattan just can't quite get it on net. And it'll stay one well, nothing. And, I mean, that was a pretty bad overcommit there for Marist. I mean, they've been kind of doing that for a majority of this game. Got to be careful. You don't want to give up those free goals if you can help it. Good save by Jason. And with the uh, halftime looming, still only a one nothing game. Yeah, and I'm not going to lie. I'm actually a little bit disappointed to see Marist... Uh actually not valuing this opportunity to score goals as much as I think they should. Last season, right around the uh, the fourth and fifth seed heading into the postseason, 
that goal differential really mattered uh, for, for some of the seeding and who had to play what team first going into the postseason. And this is a great opportunity for them to actually put up some double-digit games on the board, which have been relatively few and far between this season, right? Last season, we saw them all over the place, whether it was Delaware, RIT, or UTA. They were just miles above anybody else scoring obscene amounts of goals. That was one of the best things that RIT did. RIT didn't have the greatest record, but my God, they had the most ridiculous goal differential I've ever seen. Uh, and it actually ended up carrying them pretty far into the postseason. And Marist has an opportunity to do the exact same thing right now that I don't think they're taking full advantage of, mostly because it's, you know, it's early on in the season. I don't think people have recognized how important that can actually be. Yeah, I mean, when you've got teams, you look at the... Uh... You look at the standings and there are only limited number of playoff spots granted this is only the second week we've got a long way to go until the playoffs but um i mean you look at teams in the league as a whole and there are some very big names we watch delaware um i mean ut arlington is always going to uh come out and play well i think they're one of the best teams in the country at this point uh and i mean even teams like san jose state who I believe uh, lost to UT Arlington in five games last week, put up a good fight against them. And, that was a and, great uh, series. Oh, my God. I actually went back and rewatched that one. The <laughs> battle for Texas was something, man. Yeah, I, and, and that's, what I'm, that's what I'm saying. I think that, uh, you know, I agree with you. I think you've got to take goal opportunities where you can. And um, – with how many good squads there are, I don't think anybody can really sit back and say, yeah, we, we're definitely going to be making the playoffs because, I mean, you've got a lot of difficult teams to uh, to push through it. Delaware UTA being, you know, two of those that I think could be just about anybody here. Yeah, one minute, 14 on the clock, nearing what might... Oh! oh! Get... All right. You know, they're not done yet. They got another shot opportunity. I thought we were about to see something remotely aerial looking in nature, <laughs> and I was real excited, Hunted. Hey, they still have a chance. Oh, well, oh, he's no. going to do it on his own net. Yeah, there you go. You know what? He got the aerial. <laughs> can't, can't argue with the results. <laughs> Goodness. Oh. There are there are a few times as a commentator where I wish we could just skip the, the replay. I think that's one of the one of the very few times. We we've been talking this whole series about how we want to see the mechanics step up. That was a mechanical improvement. I, I, <laughs> even if it's towards his own goal, I think that was some of the best mechanics we've actually seen from him. So I no, I I want him to be proud of that own goal. I want him to go put that one up on the fridge. You know, you can't take it to the bank, but I in my heart that one counts. Well, I mean, not just in your heart. On the scoreboard, it counts as well. As it's going to be 6 nothing now for Marist. And uh, certainly a 3-0 sweep for them. They are going to continue their undefeated streak. And I believe that moves them to 6-0. and Yeah, 6-0 and as far as game totals go um, here in the first few weeks. So a good start to their season. But I, I definitely think that... Uh, after this week, they need to refocus. Uh, make sure that they don't relax a little bit too much. You've got... Uh, actually, I want to see who they play next week. Do we know that information already? I think we do. Uh, Marist. Where are you, Marist? Come on. Marist is playing Fairfield University. So, probably another, uh, another relatively close game. So, you've got to make sure that, uh, that you don't relax too much just because you had a relatively easy week. Yeah, you put it in the books, you get it done with an 8-0 win to finish things off. Would be nice, and 9-0 might be even better. There's room here for a few more goals, and as much as we've gotten on them for being complacent in this game, they have racked up a pretty significant score line that is going to be very, very nice padding for them later on, especially with a lot of these teams ending up going 2-0 this week, right? It puts mm -hmm. you in a position of just power, even if it doesn't actually matter uh, game-wise, right? You're so the same team you were you're going to play relatively the same but it, it's an intimidation factor even against other teams just feeling like they're the one who's behind feeling like they have to play catch up like they have to score more goals it forces everyone else to play riskier and you can kind of just sit back on that goal differential on those score lines like they are right now and vibe on out like i said 3-0 win for marist over manhattan you know 
Not the worst showing for Manhattan. Not a great one, but definitely some improvement there. Yeah, I we definitely saw growth throughout the series, and that's what we we wanted uh, out of the Manhattan team. And yeah, I I don't envy them. I don't I I don't really envy them uh, moving forward. It's going to be a, a tough season, I think, um, all the way around. If the first two weeks are any kind of indication, but I hope that they stick with it. And there's <clears throat> no better way to get better at the game of your choice than to uh, play against players and teams um, that are a bit ahead of you as far as mechanical skill goes, teamwork, things like that. And, um, you know, I, I'm hoping that we see gradual improvement throughout this, the series, the season for Manhattan, but I'm just glad that they're here, showed up and, and willing to play. Yeah, and don't forget there's more Rocket League after this one. Butler versus UConn is coming up in just a couple moments. You guys stay tuned. Keep your eyes glued to your screens and your butts in those seats. We'll be right back shortly.
Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Week two continues now with our third match of the night. We had a really entertaining first one, a really interesting second one. I feel like it's only appropriate that we round out the third with a close as hell game. How's that sound, Hunted? Hey, I'm all about it. Certainly would love to see, uh, I'd love to see a series go the distance or at least go to four games. We haven't seen one of those yet today. Yeah, and Butler versus Connecticut, two what I would say mid-table teams right now, looking at their results previously. They they were strong, but again, we, we need a statement from both of these guys, especially considering their previous performance here at EGF. It's been middling, similar to Maris, but Maris has come back swinging so far in this season. They look a lot more powered up, even with the same roster. You can tell they've been practicing. It's the same exact thing that we want out of all of the, the kind of EGF classic teams, RIT, Delaware even, both look significantly leveled up. UConn and Butler, same exact deal. We need to see improvement from these guys, and I'm ready for it, Hunted, right? I know what these guys have looked for looked like before. I know their tendencies from the previous season, and I want to see the improvements, especially on their defensive sides and building that ball out of the midfield. Well, we are uh, about ready to go. Looks like the teams are joining up now. We'll get game number one underway. Butler 
coming into this one with a win under their belt. They 3-1 Marquette last week. And uh, Connecticut coming off a close loss against Xavier. 3-2 was that one. So, again, uh, we got a team with a win, a team with a loss. Battling it out here week number two. We'll see if we have uh, three 2-0 teams today on the broadcast here at Door, as I think Connecticut would certainly uh, love to shut that one down. If possible, they are in that orange as Butler going to be playing out of the blue side. Disaster will clear it down. Kai just going to touch it into the corner. And I definitely agree that uh, defense is going to be a sticking point in this game. We're going to have to see which of these two teams take advantage of the midfield early. It's Giggy. It does make a quick save. The rebound gives him a bit of trouble, but Butler does clear. Yeah, I mean, the midfield is going to become more and more important, especially considering the ping pong that we're already playing. This ball is just flying on one end of the field to the other. And, I, you know, I'll hand it to Butler. They're playing some pretty solid defense, but there's got to be gaps here. And there's one, just unfortunately, a missed shot from Disaster, you know, living up to his namesake. Now, though, it's all up to the Butler side to actually get this ball out of their half. They've had some decent rotations here, but nothing that actually creates a passing opportunity. Mm -hmm. The double commit up at that ball creates a very dangerous one for UConn that won't be capitalized on. My goodness, that was a laser beam that bounced off the post. Disaster still trying to find some space. Will be played away. A minute and a half gone. Chirpa does keep it in. Disaster is going to throw that on net. Actually gives Geeky a bit of a problem there. Now Droys in and out of the corner. This is down in front. Chirpa tries to take that one away, but Kai just there on the block as this game starting out quite quick but UConn has been in control for the most part haven't given up a shot opportunity yet to Butler they've already put six on the board in their favor is Giggy gonna try to change that statistic there's the first one for Butler rebound gonna come out towards Kai can't quite drop it home as we approach halftime game number one we are still scoreless but UConn in control yeah it's been solid control for a majority of the time Butler, I want to talk about this lineup a little bit. Kai and Jiggy, I believe both knew Jiggy may have been around last season, but one name specifically stands out to me on this roster. Sir Aaron, really, really solid center to this team, and it's one of the reasons why their rotations have been so solid and been able to hold up to the test of time that UConn are really throwing at them. A lot of that, I know for a fact, is led by Sir Aaron, captain of the team, been holding it down for a long, long time here, Hunted. And mm -hmm. for UConn, Again, not too many familiar names, so th there's definitely room for them to make a name for themselves. The pressure has looked good, but Butler doing a great job of holding up to all this. Well, you, you know, you called him out as Sir Aaron now looking for some kind of rebound play. Honestly, I just, I appreciate the fact that they have uh, full Fortnite their car. I mean, it is a straight up <laughs> Fortnite car. I appreciate that. We just we embrace our more new epic that. overlords. Yeah. Hey, we need to see the battle bus. I can't believe Maris didn't bring out the battle buses I'm in sad. that last series, <laughs> considering. But either way, oh, Giggy ends up getting blocked away. Kai, this is towards the back wall. Sir Aaron can't quite make that play. Droys will clear it away. And this game has been very, very close, even though the shot totals kind of heavily favoring UConn. Butler's brought it back. They've gotten three on the board. They've maintained possession in this last minute or so. And the, they're knocking now as Kai is going to miss that one a bit wide. And it will be whichever these te two teams uh, can't quite slam the door hard enough going to drop this one. I have a feeling we're about to see a one nothing game. Yeah, it's definitively going to be close here, especially since UConn's had a lot less possession. I feel like Butler really feel... Oh, Lord! Great oh, save oh, by Jiggy. Oh, oh. Just barely getting there. Good 50-50 to keep it out. You know, I was just about to mention how UConn's had less and less shots over the course of this game, but they're still making them threatening when they do happen. Butler hasn't really had a solid opportunity, although they have had a lot of possession towards the latter half of the game so far. Triple Blaze went out wide. Great catch by Kai. Lays it into the corner. He's going to get it all the way across the goal. It's going to be a challenge. No, no one's there. The challenge is there and laying it back into no man's land. Now we're into the final 17 seconds of game one. Disaster avoids disaster on the goal line. Just able to play that one away as now Kai will clear it. 
Chirpa last back, trying to kill off some more of this time. See us to go into overtime. It will bounce towards the net. It's oh! in. Nobody could make the save for UConn and Butler. Walk away with game one. No time left on the board. There's some proverb in here about the tortoise and the hare or something. I'm pretty sure Butler have a grand total of one shot and one goal. Uh, I don't exactly have the stats on me right now, but that's what it felt like the entire time. But my God, did they make that one shot count? They made it five somewhere in and around the net of UConn. And you know what? Whatever gets them there gets them there. Great little buzzer beater to finish things off and turn the tides against UConn. And you, know, you saw UConn on that clear uh, at around seven seconds or so left it kind of left chirp on a tough spot he collected the ball kind of went up back wall towards the corner and that is a very difficult position to play out of because you've got incoming players you don't want that ball to bounce down in front for an easy tap in but at the same time you don't want to lose possession i think chirpa did all that they could but unfortunately the challenge just a bit too good for butler it leads to that opportunity and you've got to be pretty happy with it if you're butler but uconn uh, put themselves in a tough spot with no time left. you got to make sure that you play responsibly until you see that ball touch the ground with no time remaining and you head to overtime. Yeah, and with Butler coming away. With oh, oh, what a shot. What a challenge from disaster more than anything else. 100% knew where this ball was going. Went up with full intention to land it down and does so beautifully off of Jiggy's car. That's the one only that UConn were looking for at the beginning of the last game, too, right? They started off with that level of pressure. They really reeled it back, though, towards the end of the game. And I think if they just keep that going, keep that momentum like they would have been able to in game one, they could easily tie this thing up. Oh, no, most certainly. I mean, in a one nothing game uh, really is nothing to be scoffed at in a series like this one. These two teams so very close as now UConn looking to extend their lead. Chirpa was looking for the pre-flip. Didn't quite do it as Kai now out of the corner. Disaster towards net. Sir Aaron just going to play this one on. Gets back to the ball. This is going to put Disaster in a tough spot. Does play it away from Kai. Gets it out of the corner as well. Now Giggy last back. Can't quite find the touch, does Kai. And this thing going to reset here a little bit at the midfield line. UConn still defending this one goal lead. 350 left to go. Plenty of time for Butler to respond. But the game slowed down a little bit. We saw a little bit more faster paced action, a couple more opportunities in game one. But here in game two, the defenses are starting to push up a little bit more play at this midfield, not really letting anything through. Yeah, it's shifted from ping pong to just a battle of attrition. Who can actually last longer in this series right now? Oh my God, Butler just tooth and nail for every single one of these saves. They're getting away with it though, man. I, I can't fault them. It's the same thing that we saw last time. Just under obscene amounts of pressure from the Yukon side, but they're holding their ground until no. joy has got a breakaway. Kai for the save. Oh. He's there just in time. A double challenge even to win it all. Plays the ball out towards Terrarium, but now back into the center of the field. Great Big bump. bump leaves the goal open, but Kai's there again. And Kai coming up large. He had to go one-on-one -on -one with Droy's. Joyce was looking for that fake, didn't quite find it, and Kai clutch so far on the defensive side for Butler, but right now you don't want to be playing defense if you're the blue team. You got to find this equalizing goal. Still, they have half the game left, but Kai doing a great job of keeping them in it for right now. And Sir Aaron questionably takes us along his own back wall. Nobody going to challenge this one. Does get it back to the midfield line. Joyce will tap it in, has Chirpa there around Gigi. Kai going to be last back, looks for a demo. Ends up falling to Gigi, great pass to Kai. Can he score this one? Yes, Ooh. sir. Butler, they are on the comeback train, and it's 1-1. I mean, gently up. Kai just lays the baby to rest right here. Any higher and you're going over the net, any lower and you're going into the player. What a great little redirect there. With plenty of time left in this match, I mean... We, we already have a fantastic one on our hands between these two. You love seeing these really low scoring, really, really just large battles between teams, right? It's not about who's going to make the play first. It's about who's going to make a mistake first, leave an opening. But in those games, more often than not, it really is just all defense. You know, you'll see an own goal go in or some, some team just can't take the mental pressure. They're all Kai, all mechanics, all forcing the issue. And after all this time of playing defense, it's good to see a team be able to shift into an attacking mindset 
quickly enough and smoothly enough to pull off something like that. Still these teams battle at the midfield line. Disaster. Just trying to play this one out of harm's way. Ends up falling to the top of the box. Chirpa's there to lead Disaster on. Now the transition play comes. Back wall, quick shot. Oh. That one was a bit wide. Gigi ends up getting a piece of it. Droy's still there looking for a pass down to Disaster. But here's Kai to see it out of harm's way. A minute 20 left to go. Still a 1-1 game. UConn down in the series. 0-1 after a zero-second goal from Butler. In that first game, the only goal of game one as well as here comes Chirpa. Tries to find a double touch opportunity. Not quite going to be able to play that one. As now Kai over to Sir Aaron. Here comes the Butler counterattack. They've been quite quick. Good demo on Droy is opening up some space, but Kai can't get around that defender. And again, UConn's defense has been quite good. Uh, it's been relatively untested. Let, I mean, it, it has been solid for the times that we've seen it, but that's a double commit. That's a huge opening. Sir Aaron has a shot, but just wide of the net. 35 seconds left. We're still one goal territory. The Butler's wall of a defense right now has been the only thing keeping them alive for the time being. UConn have a, a pretty solid attack into the opposing half. Looks for a pinch down to center, but Sir Aaron knows better. He's going to make that stop. 20 now ticking down on the clock is... We might see another one go down to zero seconds. Yeah, I'm not sure if Droy's really knew how open the net was. Nobody was really back for Butler. He played a little bit too far for himself. Couldn't quite get the play out in front. But time is ticking down now. 1-1 one, one on the board. That will be the ball grounded into the turf. And we have OT game two. We missed it in game one. And almost... Look for certain like we would find it, but I'm so excited for this one as UConn look to try to equalize the series. Butler wanting to go up on match point if possible. This is going to fall down. Sir Aaron backing all the way up, waiting for a touch. Kai's going to rotate forward. Disaster along the near post. He's got the clear. Now into the corner. They battle it out. This is going to bounce out in front. Good pass out, but Sherpa going to allow Droys to play that one. And still the attack looks to continue, but Momentum fading a bit here as Sir Aaron does have to make the save on the goal line. Disaster wants to keep it moving, but unfortunately everybody just not in quite in position right now for UConn. Butler have done a fantastic job under all that pressure. They maintained their boost. They didn't get starved out. They were controlling the midfield, building their way out while they were under pressure. So they had the kind of boost in their tank to go for a recontest like that to try and take into the opponent's half. Wasn't successful. They're still under pressure now. It's UConn back in dangerous blue territory. Oh, Here no, comes Kai. Kai. Oh, he didn't quite get the flip reset. That'll be a clear for Droys. Diggy on the touch. Disaster has to play it around. As we are still in OT game two. Diggy now. Corner. Has Kai lurking through midfield. Won't quite need him as Droys is going to take this away. Sir Aaron on the miss. Now Kai just battling it back into the corner. Butler trying to maintain possession. They played well at the midfield line through this overtime. There's an opportunity for Giggy. It's towards the net, but Sherpa there on the save. Still a little bit of scramble here on the UConn side. Good clear there from Disaster, but it only goes as far as Giggy. And again, Butler hemming the UConn team in their own zone. You have a feeling it's going to break any moment. Something's got to give as Sherpa does he have the clear. He's got a lot of space. Should be able to find a little bit of time and a bit of some breathing room here for his team. I mean, it's just as tense as the rest of the match was. Kai up to another challenge. That demolition's going to be a lot for him, though. Getting rid of this pressure. Oh, Jiggy. He's got to be careful here. Turns there for the challenge. A waterfall's down. There's no one there for the touch, though, because of that oh, demolition oh, earlier. Yeah. The nerves are getting to Butler right now. This is a lot of double commits from them. They're scrambling to get this ball out of their half, and they need to relax right now because UConn, they're creating some dangerous opportunities. One here, up and over goes Chirpa, lays the ball in, has the angle, but Ooh. Kai's there just to knock it out. Yeah, Kai needed that touch. It looked like Chirpa was there for that double. He ends up playing it back in as we are over a game and a half of Rocket League in game number two. Droys actually plays this one into disaster. Sir Aaron gets it back to the midfield line, grabs boots, now an opportunity. Plays that one by Chirpa, falls right onto Droys. Kai waiting for it at the midfield line. We'll play it in. Oh, double commit out of the corner could be dangerous. But Droys does get back to it. That looks like a big mistake there from UConn. 
They haven't quite been punished for it, and that will find its way all the way back. As again, Kai sealing down. Double touch. Ooh. Kai off the post. Butler nearly made it a 2 0 series, but the post comes up big. Oh, my. This is uh, the longest overtime that we've seen this season yet, and it's just as insane as we thought it'd be. Right now, though, we, we saw Butler get a little bit scrappy in their own defensive side. UConn, though, I'm seeing holes in the defense. I'm seeing holes in the rotation. There's a lot of openings here that Butler can exploit. You can tell both these teams are getting a little bit sloppy as the nerves get high and the tensions rise. It's Butler playing heavy in the midfield to try and control this ball, putting heavy pressure onto the UConn half. The ball up. Serrera in there for a shot. Lays it in close shot. But Chirpa makes a save. And Chirpa's been big on the backside for them. He's had to cover up a lot of tough plays. Droids open net. It's in. Nobody there for Butler. UConn ties the series just like that. And Kai had not. He had a big choice to make here, right? Go up for the ball or go for the challenge on the net. And unfortunately, the miscommunication is there. And you feel like it had to be breaking down for Butler. Huge props to UConn there, though. I mean, holding it together is not an easy task. I just, all of that battle, all of the back and forth, the defenses look so good. Everybody making sure they stayed in rhythm on the rotation. And then all of a sudden, I, I, a relatively harmless break-in from Droids just turns into the game-winning goal. Nobody home for Butler. And it didn't even look like they got caught in transition. I mean, typically, I, I feel like I have a pretty good eye for that when that happens. But it surprised me that there was nobody on the goal line. I mean, they had two people back. No wonder it's a surprise, right? It, I think it, both of them ended up going for a corner boost. Kai, again, had the awkward situation of, do I go to goal? Do I go to boost? Do I challenge the ball early here? Am I going to even make it to it if I do? And that's where it breaks down is that quick decision making, right? You're making dozens 100 plus of those in just that overtime alone especially playing at that pace you can't really expect you, you have to expect it to happen eventually right some sort of slip up sure. in that regard but new game same players same sort of mental fatigue right now and i think this series just keeps getting better well we virtually had two overtimes we had an overtime in what should have been an overtime in game one did end up with butler scoring a no second goal to win that game but regardless two one goal games to start out this series it's been very close we expected it to be close and it's so far it has been quite intense and hey it's our first series of the evening that uh doesn't end in three straight games we'll get at least a game four but i still i am uh, very back and forth on who i feel is ahead right now in the series uh, you want to give it to UConn because they have a little bit of momentum coming in from that overtime win. But at the same time, Butler has had their fair share of opportunities. And I don't think they feel like they've been the worst team so far in this series. I think the biggest thing for me right now is UConn are getting a number of shots on goal. Granted, they're not doing too many things. And I feel like Butler's defensive rotations have been... I mean, significantly stronger. It's been a massive help for them in this game. But they also don't have the same number of shots. They're not putting really any shots on goal compared to what UConn have done. That's going to be the real telling matchup is can Butler last out long enough to allow themselves time to find those few shots that they need? And can they capitalize on them? Because you can be the best defensive team in the world, but if you never hit a shot on net, I can't, I can't tell you you're going to win. And right now, UConn's the only one actually attacking the net. Well, Disaster actually picks up his own pass. Nobody interferes. I thought there was a touch from his teammate, but no, it's just a playoff. The corner wall for Disaster. But the first on the board here for UConn, and they start game number three out on the right foot. Trying to put themselves on match point. Kai in transition. Giggy out to Sir Aaron. It will be shut down by Droys. There's been two minutes gone. one nothing game for UConn. We continue to play back and forth Rocket League. Possession continues to change hands. Great pass to Kai, but Droy's read that one like a book. He was able to get in the way. A double demo, almost like it was scripted there by the Butler offense. Concern, turn this around. Unfortunately not, and that double demo is just going to turn into nothing. Both players already back on the field. He's got a pretty scary cross here. Chirp is going to be there for the save. And 
I, I like this from Butler. It's a little bit more aggression, but I will say the passing plays are relatively basic. We've seen a lot of different creative looks at the net from UConn. And, well, Butler, they may not need it if they can just fire some shots on net like this, but they still haven't managed to come up with one threatening enough to beat out UConn's defense, which, I mean, it's looked solid. They haven't really gotten scored on that much, but I don't think it's been tested really at all. They've been on the attacking side so often, and Butler have been shut down at the midfield or right about the three-quarter way so many times that I, I just want to see the UConn defense tested. I feel like it wouldn't stand up to a Butler attack, but Butler haven't gone on the attack. And I think a large part of that does have to come down to Again, how the play has been at the midfield line is that nearly snuck in. Sir Aaron will score it. And Butler catch UConn trying to transition a little bit too quickly. Derpa, we talked about how great they've played in that third man role. Unfortunately, this time get caught and it's 1-1. Yeah, good pressure from Sir Aaron. I love the nurse, right? Just keeping it close and knocking the shot in nice and easy. You don't slam it in towards the net. There's no need to risk missing like that. You know, good tap in, good save by the teammate as well to keep their hands off the line on the stats where they matter. And this is the exact same scenario as it was in the previous game. 1-1, one, one, tied up. Neither of these teams want to go to overtime and certainly doesn't. Jiggy putting in a second and giving them a very solidified lead here. This is, I think, the most aggressive challenge we may have seen from Butler and also the most, we, or the furthest we've seen a ball go uncontested from UConn into their own half. Well, I mean, the stats kind of tell a different story than than what we've actually seen on the field and you look at UConn and they've been playing pretty solid defense but they really haven't been able to muster any shots they've only got the one on the board that uh, was the goal from disaster a little bit earlier on but Butler's been able to take six shots they, they haven't had a ton of possession but they've been able to turn what they have had into shooting chances and that kind of has been the big difference here in this game as Kai Trying to play this down to Sir Aaron. Can't quite get that on goal. This will be a drop down shot. Beautiful second of the game and it's 3-1. What has taken this team over? Where'd this come from, Hunted? Like a bouncing shot or a bouncing cross straight away through the net. Jiggy's laying it down from all sorts of weird different angles. A huge lead for Butler relative to anything we've seen prior in the series. They've just stepped on the gas pedal massively, and that's something that we'll see time and time again between games. You know, okay, guys, you know, we got to get it together. We got to start playing at pace again. But Butler in the middle of the game, like two minutes and 30 seconds in, have just said, all right, I guess it's time to apply the nitrous and see what happens. And oh my God, Ooh. it's working beautifully. And again, like I said, they haven't had a ton of possession, but the ball possession they have had they've turned into dangerous opportunities, which I can't really say the same for UConn as time is ticking away. 25 to go. The orange side desperately looking for two goals, trying to send us to another overtime. Oh, no. Great dunk by Sir Aaron. That's just going to fall in, and this will certainly be a Butler series lead as we head to game four. That's a really comfortable one, and we, we talked after game two about how, yeah, oh, UConn, they won in overtime. They're going to be coming in with a bit of momentum, which is always nice. It's not, like, that much momentum. Both teams were playing at pace. Both teams were holding it down. One small mistake from Butler. I think their mental game is strong enough that that's not really going to be throwing them off. This? This, on the other hand? This is a whole other barrel of monkeys to be opening right now and one that UConn are going to have to face for uh, for their mistakes. Well, I certainly I, I certainly think this series has still been relatively close. This game broke open a little bit at the end. Butler um, able to find some good shooting opportunities towards the end of that game. But I still feel like UConn has been in it from the very beginning. And if you are UConn heading into game four, yeah, it's a 4-1 four, four, loss. But again, the beauty about Rocket League is that it doesn't matter what the score was in the previous game. It could be 11 to nothing, but it's always going to be five minutes on the clock and nil-nil on the board for the next game. And UConn have to take this time that uh, we have in between the match, settle themselves, and try to come out uh, very similar to the way that they did in games one and two. I, I still feel like they have a decent edge over Butler when they get into their offensive rotation. They just need to solidify it here. Yeah, it's a matter of getting there. I think solidifying that midfield play that really fell off towards the end of the previous game. That, wait, that's why they weren't tested 
uh, deep into their own defensive side is because their midfield play was so strong, locking in their attacking side, never really giving that possession over. Oh, oh. oh it's a good fake, but it's not enough. Jiggy's going to regain possession, and it hasn't stopped at all for Butler. You can feel the confidence flowing through them. They're challenging everything they would, and that was, that was optimistic from Sir Aaron, but yeah, he's actually gotten away with it. He's gotten back. He's made the rotation disasters there, but Kai should be able to make the save. And 4.30 on the clock, this game is sped up a lot due to basically just Butler deciding that it would. Well, you've got to be careful when uh, you talk about confidence and, and overconfidence and how it can hurt a team because, you know, yeah, you can be confident, you can be feeling good, but if you play too quickly, you play a bit recklessly, you're going to get punished for it when you're playing against a team, especially an equal skilled team to you and this series has been very close i don't think there's any reason for butler to be overconfident coming into this uh game yeah 4-1 win that's great but you barely scraped by in the other games and now you have to uh you have to lay it all out on the line 343 left to go no score on the board kai looking to open up the scoring far post great shot and butler takes a one nothing lead see here's the thing with, with all this aggression and i, I hope they don't get overconfident for their own sake i hope they can keep this up because it looks fantastic i don't think it's necessarily their their best play i i think that they played better when they were playing their defensive style it's just they were so evenly matched from yukon that you know you don't really get to see it and then you throw the gas pedal into the mix you throw them stepping on it and it's less about playing better, and it's more about throwing UConn a curveball that they haven't had to play into the entire series and them struggling big time to adjust. Well, we're going to have to see them make an adjustment. I, I definitely think something needs to change here for, uh, for the team in Orange if they want to try to come back. They're down a goal, can't drop this game if they want to win the series as Kai... Oh, just off the pulse, a little bouncer. Got underneath the defender. Chirpa can't quite get the clear, but Droids is there. The net, not quite open. Sir Aaron, able to make the play. Droids now out of the corner. Can't quite find the touch. This will be disaster. Trying to make a play using that ceiling. But Sir Aaron just able to play it away. And with half the game left to go, still a 1-0 lead for this Yukon squad, or I'm sorry, for this Butler squad. Kai trying to double that now, just a bit high. And we continue to play on. I still think that we are very back and forth, but you kind of had their struggles, not breaking into the zone, but keeping uh, possession in the offensive zone. It's kind of been a role reversal here in this game. Yeah, and UConn looks significantly less comfortable on the defense than Butler. They're fighting for every single ball, and it's been a struggle, but they've kept themselves afloat in this game, regardless of those things. That's a nasty bump on a chirper right now, especially with the low boost that he has. You can tell, oh, he's just, it, it's easy targets for Jiggy. This guy's moving about five miles an hour. Dangerous touch, though, over top. Not much of an opportunity, though, for UConn because they lost that player earlier. Just sets up Sir Aaron. They need to be careful. This ball's up over the net. Chirpa has little to no boost right now, but it's just enough to get him on top of that ball. Well, we're approaching the final 90 seconds. Butler hanging on to this one goal lead, trying to end the series in four if they can. UConn wanting another overtime here in the series. He, he, they'll play this out of their own corner or out of the opposing corner. Kai now rotating around it. As Sir Aaron in transition, disaster, just going to play this at the top of the box. Sherpa quickly on it. UConn need to get some kind of offensive started. It's a good clear from Kai, but can't get by disaster. Back wall, Sir Aaron, great read. Keep that one out of the hands of Droys for the moment. That's a dribbler out in front. Kai, no problems on the clear. And again, the possession just not there for UConn. They can't get anything going in the offensive side of the field. They've got 45 seconds. It's so fall dangerously in front, but nobody's there. Kai just able to touch it away. And it looks like Butler, if they continue to play this way, they're just going to continue to waste all the time. Yeah, Butler could just go back to how they played in game one, and they will be feeling just fine. Right now, now is the time to play like you did in game one. Just park the bus, ride the game out, take this one goal, and take it to the bank. And it's going to be your best opportunity. They're still fishing for a second, though. They're feeling real confident oh. in themselves. And 
I mean, we talked about overconfidence earlier. If a goal goes in, we know exactly why it happened, right? It's Butler moving too far forward, but Jiggy's got another opportunity to try and seal this game out with five seconds on the clock. Surin's laying into the corner. This is almost inevitably the entire clock gone. They've got to keep the ball up from here, but it's right back into their own goal. Return to center from UConn, and it's Butler taking the series three to one. Yeah, three one series win for Butler. Not without effort from UConn. A very, very close series. Game ends on an unfortunate own goal. But uh, that is, uh, that's going to be it for this one. And well played again to both sides. I, I really think if we played this series, you know, five more times, uh, you, you'd probably end up 3-3 with how close it was between these teams. I, I think Butler kind of came out ahead uh, when, when you looked at the overtimes. But UConn, definitely a team to keep your eye on as the series progresses, even though they dropped this one. Yeah, I mean, I feel like the biggest strength that Butler had was their adaptation. And it was something that we didn't see game one. We didn't see game two. We saw it a little bit at the end of game three when they started to speed things up. But it really hit me in game four when UConn were already struggling to deal with just the pace increase from Butler and them taking charge of the game rather than just kind of riding it out. And then right as UConn managed to finally get a little hold on things, the demos came out. And that was what did it, right? All the rotations got thrown off. All of those adjustments that UConn had made just right down the drain because those demos started coming in. It's those proactive changes from Butler that I think really made the difference and make them a very, very threatening team, I think, to go up against for pretty much anybody. And you know what? Huge congrats to them. They earned that series 3-1. It was hard fought and... Uh, Connecticut, I know they've got great stuff ahead. There's another match that's great up ahead, though. It's DePaul versus St. John's University in a few minutes. You guys stay tuned to catch that one.
everyone. Hope you're all having a great time. It's EGFC in the Big East. We just had a really great matchup in UConn versus Butler. I'm still very... You can't be I'm, happy I'm hurt. <laughs> I'm hurt. I'm hurt. I'm not happy. It, I'm very hurt. I graduated from UConn. So that one, it still stings. But Butler played very well. And you know I'm going to have a word with those UConn players after this uh <laughs> After this stream is done, you guys right. better watch you, out. UConn, run while <laughs> run. That's good. run while I'm you kidding. still can. You guys are good. You guys are good. <laughs> but uh, let's stop talking about UConn and Butler because we have another Big East matchup. St. John's University going up against DePaul. Both these teams coming off unfortunate 3-0 losses last week in week one. DePaul, 3-0 to Seton Hall, or 0-3 oh, to Seton Hall. And then St. John's lost to a very strong Villanova uh, in three games. So a good week, you know, week two to turn it around door. And I, so for me, week one, right? Week two, yes, for these teams, it's about turning it around. But week one, more than any other week one I think I've ever seen, maybe in esports, was the strongest expectation setter. I think I've ever seen, especially coming out of the last season. I feel like, for whatever reason, in between these seasons, over the course of the summer, the level of the level of play has improved massively. You look at the top three teams, UTA, RIT, and UD, that gap is closing. You look at teams that we don't expect to be doing as well, given their performance last season, like Villanova, like Marist, uh, Colorado, looks downright incredible. And all those teams really set the stage for themselves in the first week. But there's a few teams that really missed out on that opportunity. And one of those, I think, is St. John's, who unfortunately had to play up against a Villanova, who, quite frankly, looked ridiculous compared to last season. So you're right. This is really the, the second chance. And to me, one of the few chances to reset those expectations before we get into, you know, this is the hierarchy of teams for the season. Yeah, and one thing to take note of as we get into the game one here, already a minute in, one player that I think we should look for on St. John's side is just in time. This is the player who I think is going to be the big playmaker here in this series. If St. John's is going to pop off, expect to see just in time somehow in on the play. Yeah, he's been extremely consistent. Not just this season, he's kind of an EGF vet. Glazed Donuts also looked pretty good last week, but it's DePaul coming out the first. Gravity sneaks one in from the side, and with three players back, it's actually really surprising to see this one go in, but a quick, small... I mean, it was a double commit. It may have been a bump attempt over in the corner, but I can tell you what it absolutely was. It was greedy from St. John's. It, it was a little greedy, and when you have two of your own defenders in the same corner, it's just unfortunate defensive positioning. Now, looking back on the play, St. John's, they can make the adjustments no problem at all, but they just have to be very weary because DePaul sees that opportunity. They're going to take it. Always one to strike when given the chance. DePaul are a solid team, finishing middle to bottom-ish of the pack last season. If memory serves me correctly, St. John's in a similar position, not having the greatest performance of their lives. But, I mean, I, I've i said it before, these teams all look so much better after a quick little postseason. And it's been relatively close. Almost halfway through the match, they've all been floating around from one end of the field to the other. I haven't noticed either team really struggling to build out of their own halves. The one thing I think I could see a little bit more of is maybe just pace of play and some more individual mechanics when, when going for plays and not just limiting yourself to team play. So, anyone who knows me, personally, I I value team play way more than mechanics. I, I would honestly should. also, as 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 I should. <laughs> it's weird <laughs> saying that. Weird saying that. But I, I think it's very important that these teams uh, don't crutch themselves on. The solo mechanical plays because as long as they can keep this ball moving around the field and they keep the defense on their toes it's going to create a lot of opportunities now of course it does help when you have a solo mechanical mastermind on the pitch being able to set up plays of their own but you want that movement as well as a fantastic opportunity just in time seeing it present itself but couldn't get it on target 
And, and that's the thing, though. For me right now, as much as I think, you know, playing consistently, playing the team game is normally, like, super duper solid, I see the same thing in both these teams right now. I feel like I'm watching the same team play on either side, and both of them are just playing, you know, solid fundamentals, playing their rotations, playing their team play, looking passive when they can, and oh my god, how did he sneak that through? I'm just taking a look at how. But right here, very good on Rumble to play it slow, understanding. I mean, it, it does help when the defender in the end hits it in. Granted, a little bit, a little the, ball bit. Was on, the, the, the ball was on target either way. But it's just defensive mistakes here on the side of St. John's. And that's not just the only time. Same thing happened with the first goal as well. So you're right. Both these teams playing very carefully, but it's the first team that makes the mistake that gets capitalized upon. And I think you can call it boring Rocket League because not as exciting. But it's very, very good for DePaul. I really do like how they're playing. Yeah, I mean, for the team that's 2-0 up, they could play this all day. I think the question comes for St. John's. At what point do you have to start taking risks to, A, close this gap? Oh, no. Oh, no. Well, you want to talk about mistakes. Uh, example A. Again, and this is a huge unfortunate. It's unfortunately uh, caused by the defensive rotation. You notice how two of St. John's University players were going into that front corner where the ball was already in place instead of rotating around the back side of the goal would have given them a much better opportunity to make the play on the ball their lone player net wouldn't have felt so congested or so pressured to make the save it really does all add up you could put it all on the last defender like right here is another example but it, it doesn't help when you're setting yourself up for these mistakes to occur because of your defensive positioning. Yeah, they, they had more than one opportunity to try and get behind that ball to try and contest it. And I mean, it hurts to see because, like, obviously you don't want to put yourself in those positions. But to see three of those saves missed in a row feels kind of bad for DePaul or feels kind of bad for St. John's. DePaul are living it up right now. What am I saying? Oh, yeah, they're feeling really good. Yeah, they're, they're, they're happy to take these goals and run. I think you need the game to reset, though, if you're St. John's. You, you just oh, want to get these last couple seconds over with, get to another five minutes, and just take it from there. That's exactly what needs to happen right now. It's unfortunate, but hey, you cut your losses after game one. Totally fine. Game two, reset the clock, reset the scoreboard. Things will be good for you. Well, and I did really like, I really did like how game one started for St. John's. Uh, don't get me wrong. I thought that they started very competitively with DePaul, but unfortunately they let this one slip away. Yeah, I mean, it slipped through their fingers, slipped past their net, slipped past their defense, whatever you want to say, they didn't. I, I think it's ironic that at the end of the day, there were relatively even number of shots from either side because it really was. I mean, I want to give DePaul credit. They played a solid game and they didn't slip up, but... I think that game was a lot more defined by St. John's mistakes, and I hope that St. John can make it so that their mistakes don't define them over the course of this series, right? There's a clear opportunity to just stop it from happening, go to a game two. You just start the series down when you have to just put it behind you. I, I don't think there's anything more you can do. I don't think they need an adjustment. I thought they were playing pretty solid. Like you said, the team plays there. If you want to spice it up, if you feel like you're playing from behind, feel free to go for something a little bit more aggressive, but... Right now, they've been punished every time that they go aggressive, that they leave that one person back on defense, that they try to have faith in their team. So you have to feel like the confidence isn't going to be there to go for those aggressive plays. So, yeah, I, I really do think that just leaning back on what you did at the beginning of the series has got to be the right play here and just getting the mental reset there. It's the most important thing by far. Well, good thing for St. John's. This four starts off at 0-0 here in Game 2, and right away they're going to start up on the offense. And here's where I think they need to make a statement. If they come out fast in game two and kind of catch DePaul on awkward footing, could lead to a big momentum shift their way as they're already beginning their offensive momentum. Rumble's got good control. Just in time looking to break it up. Glazed Donuts from across the field. Gravity has to make this save. It's a tough one, but he's got it. Nice and locked down now. Trying to keep the pressure on St. John's. No, they're not trying to keep the that pressure on. They just let him have it. They let him have it, and that is unfortunate. Oh. This is exactly what leads to this goal here, Cameron. Think about this. 
Think about this. That ball was challenged in midfield. You wouldn't have two defenders on your backboard in an awkward spot hitting that one centered to the offense. If you see the ball at midfield, you have to turn that into a 50-50 opportunity. You absolutely cannot give DePaul a free attempt downrange. Now, they're going to see that. DePaul's going to see that. And, of course, they're going to go for it. Because if they don't, it's Ooh. just a wasted opportunity. And here it is. And I, I don't want to be too critical of St. John's because I'm, I'm a firm believer, and I said this last week as well, mechanical mistakes totally can look past those. But we are consistently seeing St. John's kind of finding themselves in their own back corner away from the action and not in a favorable defensive rotation. And it's just a little thing here where if you cut back to just the fundamentals, it would it would help them out extremely well. I mean, you said it earlier, right? The, the mechanical mistakes are there, but the opportunities for those mistakes to happen are made by the defensive rotations. And it, it's that kind of difference that one thing in a Rocket League game can make, right? It's, it's literally just the defensive rotations. Their shot opportunities look okay. Their challenges in the attacking half look pretty good. Their attacking rotations look solid. They're creating opportunities and they're getting shots on the net. But again, those defensive rotations have failed them so many times that we just spent a lot more time on their end of the field looking at a ball in the net that has unfortunately gone by because they left open the opportunity and you know what i have to hand it over to depaul right now because they've recognized every single one they haven't really let him slip at all and they're keeping them on their toes right now unfortunately for st john's unfortunately but hey there's still three minutes to go and i speak to you so you know honestly <laughs> the caster's yeah. cur the caster curse is real I am a firm believer in the caster curse, and unfortunately, it goes in, well, not really unfortunately for DePaul, because they're very excited. They're saying, Greek, keep on talking. <laughs> it but, transcends uh, all again, esports, all, all games. It's every esport. Yeah. It's every esport. <laughs> but, oh, boy. Three, three minutes left. They're only down by three goals, and we're seeing some decent offensive opportunities present themselves for St. John's, they can they can honestly turn this around. I'm a firm believer in that, and this is a squad where we know their technical ability is there. I mean, when they lost to Villanova last week, it was still a very close series. I got my notes with me. But, again, Oh, wow. Gravity's getting what? so creative with these. Gravity oh, dude. brought this all the way downtown and then just bullied oh. the defense. <laughs> oh, my goodness. He put some shoulder into that one. I mean, come on. After mind game and the other guy, too? I That, that I think, is the third time we've seen a goal from Gravity off the back of a mind game. And, oh, my God, the pull. DePaul just don't stop. They carry momentum so well. I actually feel like this is... I mean, obviously, there's mistakes from St. John's here, and St. John's have a negative amount of momentum. But DePaul have just turned up, and when they're winning, it feels like they oh, are yeah. really going at it. I mean, you can't blame them here, Dor, because they got to keep up this momentum. If they let off for even a second, it will give St. John's enough opportunities to turn this series around. DePaul is all about this momentum, and they are currently in the driver's seat. Is, I thought for sure Gravity was going to get a touch. Could he get another touch on the net? It barely goes wide, but they are not stopping. St. John's looking for some sort of reprieve into the attacking half. They've got a counterattack, but they're down a man. They can't get there in time, just in time. He just got to play this one back into his own defense, but he's regretting doing even that because Rumble sticking to him like white on rice, laying the ball to the center of the field for a dangerous shot, but it's cleared just in time. A minute and 35 seconds to go here in game two. And now DePaul looking to add on to their lead. 6-0. They're already looking towards game three. They're looking for the sweep. St. John's now in reverse sweep territory. They're going to have to win the next three games. Unless, I mean, a mir like, unless a miracle happens here in game two. Game one started out with both these teams playing some vanilla Rocket League, right? Just the fundamentals, knock the ball across, push up with your team. 
switch from defensive to attacking rotations, and when you're back, you know, just just playing normal stuff, not looking for any plays that are excessively creative or, you know, nothing too aggressive. DePaul is nothing but sauce right now. Passing plays, mind games, bumps, demolitions. They are breaking out every little bit of cheddar they've got in their cheese bank to score these goals. And oh my God, Greek, I love every second of it. <laughs> this is really good play here, but take a look here. Glazed Donuts, last man back. Super unfortunate position. And he, you can't blame him for that because the the speed that DePaul is able to move this ball around the field on the your offensive half is taking the entire defense out of the play. They're looking to do it again. Just two members left between them and a goal. Gravity is going to miss it. Leaves it up for Primal and Lavish to go at. It's going to be a 50-50 cleared right back to the middle. Rumble's got a dangerous shot. Two members in to try and make the save. It's going to glaze Donuts just in the time now. Taken down by another teammate. Gravity now stuck in the attack of calf, and this ball's not going anywhere. DePaul just continue. Every time St. John's get a little bit of reprieve, it's just from a clear that goes right back into their hands. This, though, is an opportunity they're going to look to capitalize oh, on. The ball's laid okay. up just in front of the goal, just in time for the save. No, oh. he can't finish it off. It's back out, and DePaul again in control. You're going to pinch it all the way back off the backboard and create more pressure here. In 10 minutes of Rocket League, DePaul has outscored St. John's 12 goals to none. St. John's needs to change up their gameplay going into game. Oh, oh, almost changing that stat it. line for me. Almost changing it. But St. John's, they need, to, they need to make a quick change here in game three or else it's going to be very difficult to surmount a reverse sweep. And right now, it, it really is that rotation if they can just settle down and they don't have to be frantic about it either because I think if they're more calmed down because I understand it's very intense DePaul is not giving them any breathing room but if they're able to make their own space it will greatly help them out going into game three right yeah. now DePaul though on the flip side of things DePaul's playing extremely well they want to keep up this pressure they ha DePaul has to go into game three with the same energy that St. John's brought into game two in the very, very early on, but they weren't able to maintain that. DePaul needs to come out into game three with that style, and they'll be able to take it no problem. St. John's, they need... It's, it's hard to say that they need to do the same thing, but they need to calm things down. They need to slow it down because they are not playing at their desired tempo. And, you know, we've talked a lot about what St. John's need to do and what DePaul has done, what they can do to maintain this lead. I want to actually talk about what this means for DePaul in the future. Are they going to be this momentum-based of a team? Because what does this team like play like when they're down? What does this team play like when they're not the ones in the driver's seat, when they're not the ones controlling the game? Because it could be one of those teams that's entirely reliant on just which way the match is going or what day of the week it is. And we're, I think that's something to really look for in the upcoming weeks. We'll have to see here as we are now in game three. DePaul trying to close this one out, but St. John's, again, starting on the offense is very good. I want to see this. I want to see this energy that they bring. Oh, but they need someone centered. As soon as that ball goes to the center of the field in front of the goal, you need someone attacking it. You need to create that opportunity. DePaul isn't going to wait for you to come hit the ball. They're going to clear that out as soon as possible. So if they can up the urgency in that department, it will lead to a much more productive offense. This is a lot from DePaul. Uh, and while very low on boost, mind you, I think that's one player who has realistically anything left in the tank for them right now to build out of their half. But they've done it. There's no punishment right now from St. John's. The pace just isn't there to keep the pressure on through a play like that. Beat him to the corner again, though. Continue the boost star, but there it pays off. Just in time, this puts in the first of the game. is exactly what I've been looking for from St. John's. You have to be up for that ball. Make it a 50-50 just in time. Finishing things off. Excellent job. St. John's, their first goal in 11 minutes of Rocket League. Pays off for them, but they oh, gotta watch out. The ball can strike right back. <laughs> <laughs> they're they're really going for the mental game. I'm not gonna lie. That is what probably the fifth or sixth tr attempt at the mind game at the fake. 
that we've seen just this match between Lavish and Gravity. And they're not done yet. Rumble's up over top. Beautiful little touch of the air. And it's up right bins to even up the score. No amount of team play came out of that one. It was just raw mechanics and aim. Oh, man. The hesitation. You see on the play, Rumble was in the back of the net. Good spot to start at when your opponent's all the way downfield, but crept up just a little too much. And by then, it was too late to get up to make the save, even with a full tank of boost, mind you. And that's why positioning so key in Rocket League. Well, maybe a goal for DePaul, maybe an even score, but mind you, St. John's are far from out of this one, and honestly, it's the best showing that we've seen since early into Game 1. They're holding their ground strong, the attacking side looks decent, a little bit shaky, though, ever since they lost that first possession of the ball. But they're going for it, and that's what I want to see. They're that's another one shot. I bet! Oh, no, that's a double commit live. This is free. This is free. It's 2-1 for DePaul. Oh. They've got their lead back. That's tough, and... You, and you wonder if it's a communication error because you have two players coming in from both sides of the net on that double commit. So they knew they were coming. But again, just unfortunately unable to get the ball out. The ball take the lead here. And now the clock is running against St. John's as they need to tie this one up before it hits zero. Plenty of time, only halfway through the match at this point. It's all about getting that possession because ah, the midfield is just all DePaul all the time. And that, that's what DePaul is doing so well at. They are possessing oh, the midfield. Oh. And this, one, this one's unfortunate here. If I was the defense on this play, you got to get up for that ball much faster. I, I do like that they're using the backboard to conserve a little bit of boost to get to that level. But again, the double commits there. You need someone who's on that rear post position in net, they would have made the save. Instead, double, both players committing to the same ball on that front post cost them in both positioning and in the goal. And honestly, I feel like it hasn't even been the, the cleanest pressure necessarily from DePaul. They've been pinging the ball at the backboard, at the net, and waiting for those double commits. That's why they've all been highlighted, right? We said it earlier. DePaul has done nothing oh, yeah. necessarily on their own other than highlight the mistakes of St. John's and never missing a beat when they do it. And yeah. I think they've recognized that, right? They don't have to go for huge passing plays. They don't have to even rotate players into the attacking side. Just send the ball into the other half and look for those telltale rotations from St. John's to try and capitalize on. Here comes another one, too, as the ball's played dead center. Glazestone is in primal. Swing across it, and a very, very quick rotation forward for St. John's. Rule one. Oh, we We're playing 2v2, Greek. 2v2. This is going to be very interesting to see how both teams go ahead and make their adjustments here as Rumble had a fantastic opportunity. Couldn't put it on net, but Lavish still has boost. He's going to hit this one to Rumble the shot. No! Not made! And now this could be an excellent opportunity here. But St. John's looks like they're all out of boost and are going to have to play a little bit oh. of defense for now. No, Rumble picked up the midway one. They're just playing it slow right now, keeping the ball possession. It hasn't left Orange half since we've entered the 2v2. And St. John's, they're already struggling enough to build out of their own half to begin with. But now you throw a 2v2 into the mix where the ball's pinging around a lot more. The mechanics get a lot more involved. This is what DePaul want. The ball square That's up in the middle net. of the goal, they but St. John's, this one in. there's a counterattack here. Huge opportunity. Can they make it? We'll have to see if Primal can get there. It's a one-on-one -on -one opportunity. Just needs to put it on the net. Let's the ball get a little bit too far away, and Rumble reads it. 30 seconds left. We're out of rule one. It's Rumble oh, over the no. top to try and seal it out. Can't quite get the shot with 20 seconds, but Lavish absolutely will. 4-1, that might just be the nail in the coffin, Greek. And I believe... Did Lavish break? Someone broke the rule one. We don't know who did it. And we won't name names. We don't know who did it. We, we won't name names. <laughs> did not see it. So, regardless of that, oh, 17 that's gross. seconds left. A four-goal lead now for DePaul. Outscoring St. John's now 17 goals to one. The offensive productivity from them has been phenomenal this series. I let, and like, 
I really want to highlight how well DePaul is playing. This is coming from week one where they got 3-0'd. They've made an incredible comeback, and this is a fantastic statement for them moving forward, saying, hey, we're not just going to get pushed around. We're going to come back from our losses and be better. And this is an excellent way for them to say that. They will take this series 3-0 over St. John's. Wow, wow, wow. DePaul. Ooh, what on earth happened to these guys? Rule one was broken. We are cursed now. I'm going to find I'm actually going to Oh, find out. no. Rude, rude. We have to know. <laughs> this is investigative journalism is part of our casting. Oh, oh it's glazed donuts. No, that's why you got three. The, re the reverse sweep was coming. It, they, <laughs> they just had that face. Oh, boy. All right. Well, he fessed up to it. We, we got him, boys. They, 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 Get him off the team. Up. They fessed up. <laughs> All right, well, congratulations Alrighty. to DePaul. St. John's, you know what? Come back next week, show us the same thing. I'd love to see it personally, but for me, that's all I am on the broadcast. And ladies and gents, there's more on the back end, though. It's going to be Canisius going up against Quinnipiac in just a moment. George is going to be staying with you guys. Cool J is going to be joining for me. That's all I have for tonight. If you want to follow me, my Twitter handle is right down there. It helps me out massively. Same goes for George, even though he's not getting off right now. Uh, he'll catch you in just a couple minutes, ladies and gents. So keep your eyes glued to your screens and your butts right in those seats. EGF will be right back.